Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lynn O'Hara. I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. I'm very excited to be joining you this evening. Uh, we are, this is one of our partnerships for our Tech Talk webinar series. We're looking at the leadership and legacy and history theme with our partners, uh, the Library of Congress, uh, working with two of my favorite people to work with on a webinar. We've got Cheryl Letterly and Kathy McGuigan joining us tonight. They're looking at the idea of leadership and legacy, the NHD theme, and they're also looking at some very specific primary sources from the library's women's suffrage movement collection. Uh, these are some really neat documents, and they really do a nice job of not only just showing you how to find these documents, but also what to do with them when you have them in front of your classroom of students. So we're very excited to have them joining us tonight. What I'd like to talk about is how to ask questions. There are times where you might have questions. There are also times in which Cheryl or Kathy might ask you for responses. Uh, the best ways to do that for direct questions, ask in the question box. You can use that for a question. You can also use that for a response. The other option is that you can tweet them. Uh, we are going to be live tweeting some of the highlights. Please use the hashtag TeachNHD because that lets us know and directs your comment directly to us. What I'm going to do at this point is turn things over to Kathy McGuigan. Um, she's going to get us started this evening. And thanks so much for joining us, Kathy. Thank you for, for hosting us. Um, we are really excited. Uh, this is our first webinar with National History Day for this school year. Um, and we're thrilled to be offering um, this one as well as others in the series. And Lynn will talk a little bit more about that. Um, Cheryl is still in the process of joining us, um, and I am trying to do two things at once, which is to send her a message. She's having some technical difficulties. For all you folks out there in the schools, I want you to know that we experience technical difficulties <laughs> with our equipment, um, and she is experiencing that with her um, laptop tonight. So she will be joining us very shortly. Um, but I wanted to um, start off um, our segment of the evening's program and talking a little bit about um, my experience in working as a judge uh, for National History Day. For the last couple of years, I've been privileged to be a judge at the national competition. Um, and one of the things, um, the, the thing that was really exciting for me was to see how students interact with the materials. And one of the things that I was struck by is how often students used primary sources in their projects um, and conducting their research, but how little I heard about the analysis of the sources. And because I work for the Library of Congress and because I work for the education outreach team of the Library of Congress, of the analysis of primary sources is central to what we do. And so I just wanted to couch um, a little bit of our perspective in working with National History Day, working with National History Day coordinators, with teachers, with students, um, and really trying to bring forth that the, the, the skills in analyzing. Um, so we're going to be spending some time tonight um, doing that. Um, also, I wanted to go through the expectations for the, uh, the evening's program. We're um, looking at the leadership and the legacy of leadership um, and primary sources and looking at the women's suffrage mo movement. Um, you may be familiar with the article that we put in this year's theme book. Um, so tonight, uh, participants will discuss strategies for incorporating primary sources into projects and learn where to find more resources from the library about women's suffrage. Um, so I will pause right there and see if you have any questions um, based on um, the evening's program. Lynn, do I have the ability to move the... No, but I do. Actually, you do okay. too. Okay. Let's see here. Should we go okay. ahead and start with our map here? Yep, let's go ahead and, and do that. So we're going to jump right in. And it looks like we're jumping right into the collections. Um, okay, so... 
we're going to jump right in and take a look at this particular primary source. And my first question, and uh, Lynn, will they be able to type in their responses to the chat box? Go ahead and put your, your responses into the question box. Oh, into the question box. Okay. So my first question to the audience is, what do you see? Okay, a map of the U.S., Alice Paul, routes for potential travel from across the nation to Chicago, map with photo of Alice Paul, called a woman to come to a convention in Chicago, route concentrated in the West. I imagine these suffrage advocates drew a lot of attention wherever they traveled. And that comment was from Colleen Hall. Colleen, I'm going to ask you to expand upon that and what makes you say that. Western bound migration of suffrage appeal. Directions to Chicago, dates, but year not included. Oh, good point. Okay, it's made by National Chairman, Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. There's nothing in either the Northwest, Northeast, the Midwest, or the South. I'm not sure I'm getting all the responses. Here we go. Okay, now I can see better. I don't know if mine's working. Amber, yes, I can see that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I just got a question. Can you see this? I don't know if mine is working. Uh, Colleen responded back when I asked her um, to, to, when I asked what made you say that. I was just thinking about societal expectations of women. Oops. Traveling alone, I imagine, would have generated a good deal of attention. Hannah Feldman, it's obviously a political appeal, a call to action. Okay, Hannah, what makes it obvious? Um, you say it's an advertisement for their cause. Marjorie says wishing to see voting data. Sue, I can hear and see the map. That's an interesting comment, Sue. Uh, Connor Fitzsimmons, many women in the West already had voting rights, hence the voting women of the West. So Connor is bringing in prior knowledge um, to that comment. You see a map of railroads in the mid-1800s. Envoys all left from D.C.? Question mark. This comes from Kristen Camilio. Only Eastern City referenced. Okay. All right, these are all excellent observations. Okay, I'm going to slide this over. Thanks for your patience as we get through. This is my first time on this system for the year. So there's the question of what do you see? Okay. My next question to you is why do you think this image was made? I heard a little bit um, about a call to women voters. Um, it's an advertisement advertises the possible forming of a new political party where focus is women. That comes in from Hannah Feldman. Um, it's a poster from Laura McCarty. And questions about Alice, Susan, um, I'm 
Susan H., uh, I can't pronounce your last name, um, questions about Alice Paul and how she might have been elected or appointed. Okay. I think Kathy's got a really good point about that why question because I think a lot of times students focus on the what as opposed to the why. So what other ideas might we have about why the image was made? Amber shares, this would definitely be to promote the topic of women's rights. I did a project on this and Virginia Minor had an extreme part to play. Irene shares, Prescott shares, possibly to gain support for the cause. Allison M. says, shows a growing united front to give strength to the movement. And Matthew Gold shares, a call to action for women who want to form a political party for suffrage. John wonders, maybe to spurn women and sympathetic men in the East to action. Interesting. Connor Fitzsimmons, to show the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage that action was being taken. Susan H. shares, illustrate the larger picture to those who might be hesitant. Okay, going along with something that was already said. Lynn Ketter show, shares, form a coalition of uh, women voters and supporters. Corinne says, showing women across the country that the movement wasn't isolated. So someone sends in a question, am I being muted by an organizer explained on my computer so I can reactivate your mic. All the participants tonight are muted um, and your, your conversation will happen through the question box. Excellent question. Suzanne Diavolon, I agree with taking trains, showing the routes, everything else mentioned could be shown without a map. Interesting. This could show where women could gather for traveling together to Chicago, Elizabeth Skelton um, submits. And Matthew Gold follows up, perhaps it was made to share with women who were attending the conference. Okay, interesting. Okay. Uh, Patrick Shanahan to display the support already gathered in the West and to use those already supporting to continue to spread the word. Okay, then my next question to you, and keep them coming in, my next question is, when do you think it was made? Colleen notices, I am noticing the title now, maybe to learn strategies from Western women. Amanda, 1919. Oh, Cheryl literally has joined us. Uh, I see June 5th, 6th, and 7th, but I don't see a date. Excellent, Cheryl. Uh, we'll be switching her over to uh, organizer status in uh, just one second, and she'll be joining us on the mic. Um, Colleen uh, mentions Gilded Age, late 19th late 19th, early 20th, early 20th century. And Connor says, I'll cheat prior to women's suffrage. All right, Sue says, it might be the routes taken for westward supporting travel routes for women. It was made in 1900 to early before 1920 summer. Since it's Alice Paul, Jan says, it could be early as 1900. Amber says this was definitely made in the 1800s. Amber, I'm going to ask you um, to, dis to, to say why you say it was definitely made in the 1800s. All right. All right. And I'm going to pause for one brief moment and see if Cheryl is on her mic. Hi, testing. Hi, yeah, Cheryl. We can hear you. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Kathy. Hi. I'm going to finish off this question, Cheryl, and then I'll give you, um, I'll give it over to you for the next question, all right? Fantastic. All right. So Lynn, says, Lynn Ketter says, I disagree with not including the map. Visual of map shows scope of interest and possible influence. Um, and I'm sorry, Cisrell, I'm, I'm hoping that I have the name correct. I think it was made in the time of the women's movement, but I do not know the year. 
Corin Patterson guessed 1880 with a question mark. Al Alana McGinnis around 1908 after the death of SBA. Uh, Amber is taking back something. I would guess Vanessa. I would guess it would be as early as 1900 or late 1800s. Uh, Sue Connolly says, I went online and looked at Alice Paul, 1913. <laughs> ah, all right. Uh, Kristen says, uh, early 1900s. All right, I'm going to let, um, I'm going to move the slide for Cheryl, um, and I'm going to let her introduce the next question to you. Hey, everybody. Sorry to be a little bit tardy joining this, but I'm excited to be here with you. Um, my next question for you is, who do you think was the audience for this? Cheryl, this is Lynn. You can see some of the responses in the question box. We also have some responses coming in about middle class white women, women suffragettes, activists, activist women, uh, women who are voters. Okay, now I've got it. Thank you. The question box disappeared when I uh, changed status here, but now I found it again. So, uh, women suffrage. Suffrage advocates traveling east to petition Congress. So sympathetic to the suffrage movement. I would um, press all of you as you're answering these questions to give us just a little more information about how you came to form your answers. If there's something that um, makes you think that, something you already know, or something that uh, you see in the map, that would be great. Susan says, women who already had the right to vote in the West. Again, I'd, I'd invite you to give us a little flesh on those answers. Um, I, I understand Kathy said earlier, that students need to analyze their primary sources, not just cite them. And I push you just a little bit to, to practice some of those skills, offering evidence. Excellent. <clears throat> There's a statement that is a call to women voters. Thanks, Jen, for, for adding that a little bit. Allison notes that the map also reinforces a sense of patriotism and that this is an American cause. Allison, I'd love to know what you're responding to on the map from that. Um, Laura says, would the metadata give an interpreter some information to help answer the questions? Laura, I love that question. Um, I'll sh we'll get to that in a few minutes, but thank you for, for bringing that up. Jan also notes these Western women are mentioned as being appealed to by women from the East, envoys, some, some close reading of the title information on this. Um, I think we're beginning to switch a little bit to the next question, which is what do you wonder about, or excuse me, what, do you, what can you learn about leadership from examining this image? And I'm, I'm sure Kathy already set this up, but if you're still thinking about the previous question, that's fine. Feel free to continue answering. If you have a thought that doesn't fit my question, feel free to put that in. Irene notes that women needed political allies. This map would show that the movement was not isolated. Amber notes that the main starter of this was Miss Alice Paul at that time. You might think about what that says about Alice Paul as a leader.
the language of the poster, a call to women voters, and the title on top are evidence of the intended audience. Thank you, Matthew. Amber Jensen asks the question, would Virginia Minor be a leader in this movement? Any other thoughts on what this tells you about leadership? These are, the questions aren't coming up in a exactly chronological order for me, so um, my apologies if I overlook reading your answer for the group. Um, Irene notes that the map shows, oops, I lost Irene's comment for me. The map shows Kathy Ellen, feel free to jump in if you can, if you like. The, uh, the questions and comments are jumping around quite a bit for me. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Cheryl, I can help you out. Some of the things that we're seeing is something about standing for a cause. Um, Mary's talking about leaders and pathways seem to align with capitals often. Um, another response is having a vision and planning for bringing the vote to women across the nation. Uh, another response, Susan Haidt, perhaps they were railroad stops. Uh, Terrific. Quite a, well, there were, there were quite a few non-capital locations. Um, and the last point is that leader can be a young woman, uh, the leader of a political party, even though women can't vote at the time. Terrific. Thanks, Lynn, for helping me out. Um, I'm not seeing any of that on my screen right now. Um, Cheryl, so that's, I'm yeah. sorry, this is Kathy. I just want to interrupt. You can make that question box a little bigger. Um, there's a there's a, a icon to make it bigger and then you can drag it out to um, get yeah, more thanks. comments. I've, thanks, I've done that. They're okay. not coming in in any good order, so okay. I'm, I'm just getting lost in it. But that's okay. okay. We'll, we'll work together and okay. make it work. So the, the last question to think about here is what can be learned from this and um, Think about that as, go ahead on to the next one, it's fine. But think about that as think about that as you look at this bibliographic record. This is um, the information that we know about this item. And um, an earlier question was, would the record on this give us any additional information? So take a minute and read this. It tells you the date, 1916, the location, the United States. It repeats the title, um, and it gives you a lot of subject headings. We'll loop back and talk about those subject headings um, a little bit later when we get into another the portion where we're going to talk about how to find resources. So this particular record doesn't answer a lot of questions other than the more precise timing. Um, feel free to continue to use the chat box to add in questions as you have them to, to communicate. Lynn and Kathy and I are all watching that box and we'll get to you um, as we can. I'd like to move on and show you some of the tools that we use when we prepare these web presentations and 
Yeah, every slide is hot linked. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's mess. That's messing things up here. <laughs> that would be sorry me. about that. Um, it's okay, we'll get there. Um, the same tools that you can use with students are the tools that Kathy and I used when we put this webinar together. Um, this is a teacher's guide to analyzing photographs and prints. And we put these guides together. We have a whole suite of them for many different formats that are commonly found on the library's website. And we put these together working with the experts who manage the collections. And we said, sat down with them and said, when you get a new photograph, what questions, how do you interrogate it? What do you think about? And we formed their answers into a question set. I've highlighted in yellow the questions that I thought would move this conversation in a productive direction this evening. Um, you might notice just visually most of the questions that, that we talked about tonight are from the reflect column. Um, and that was intentional on my part. I, I figured that as adult learners, um, you would be pretty facile and adept at observation, noting and identifying the details, and that you would be eager to generate and test hypotheses about the image. So that's where I really selected the questions for tonight. If you were introducing this skill to your students, you might rely much more heavily on the observe column to help them dig deep into seeing what's on the primary source. Um, the right side column is question, generating those wonderings. And we heard some of those coming up naturally in your chat comments, thinking about, about this, trying to put it into context. Um, one of the things we do is take those questions and funnel them, because sometimes the questions that come up are somewhat random and can't really, aren't going to be good researchable questions. But the, to work with the student's whole primary source analysis and funnel those into the, the bottom section, further investigation, and that's to think about, so what can I learn from this that contributes to my research? And what questions um, does this raise? If you would advance to the next slide. Well, wait, Cheryl, before oh, you sure. advance, um, uh, there's a question that came in. It says on the bottom, I see beginning, advance. What are those for? Oh, fabulous. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Um, those are some follow-up activity ideas. And um, they're really made to be very flexible, to, be, to suit a lot of needs. And so, for example, a beginning level activity that we actually use a lot in our professional development workshops is write a caption for the image. I didn't choose to do that with this since the image we were working with was so richly titled already, and a lot of you dug into that language. But it's a, it's a terrific, low prep, easy way to get students thinking about. So if I had to sum this up in a few words, um, how would I do it? It works very well um, with pairs or small groups of students who have to come to consensus and articulate what they're seeing. We've got them for intermediate and, and more advanced. The more advanced one for this one is have students expand or alter textbook or other printed explanations of history based on the images they study. Um, one of the things we'll make sure you know before we say goodbye tonight is where to find the whole set of these tools. We have them for many formats. Cheryl, this is Lynn. We can also post this tomorrow with the webinar recording. Um, we'll put a link there for teachers who are looking for this form and other forms that they can use with their students. Fantastic. Thanks, Lynn. If there are no additional questions, I want to, I want to show you the student version of this filled out in my very own, you can see I was not ever allowed to teach elementary school. Um, this is what it can look like. Some observations, some reflections, some questions. I've added arrows to sort of connect my thinking on this. And sometimes um, the observation might lead to a question. I see a photo of Miss Alice Paul. Was she well, so well known that she'd be recognized? And then another question, what was the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage? And my further investigation questions 
for this are what role did Alice Paul play in leading the suffrage movement and what was the legacy of Alice Paul and the Congressional Union for Woman Suffrage. If you've looked at the theme book um, or have that open, I'll, I'll just confess that I plagiarized these <laughs> liberally, generously. Um, these are excerpted from the theme book article. Um, so if you're if you want to see a more fleshed out version of of the whole thinking process, that's where you'll find it. So um, we've got I've put an arrow here to point to the further investigation, and we've I've typed them up so you don't have to struggle with my handwriting. What I'd like to do is model with you next the next step in the process, which is to bring in an additional source. This is a newspaper. Um, this is the last couple of paragraphs of a letter to the editor. And I have uh, just a few questions to direct your thinking about this. As before, though, use my questions if they help your thinking, but lo don't let them confine it. So what was the purpose of this text is one of the first questions to consider. And Lynn and Kathy, I'm going to ask you again to um, feel free to help me if I don't see a question or don't respond to it. Okay. We've got a response from Matthew about, uh, seems to be a letter to the editor from Alice Paul. Uh, Colleen said to address the misunderstandings of the CUWS. Sorrell says it was a warning to women voters. Uh, we've got a comment to use as a citation and to deal with misconceptions. Uh, here's a go. And Connor says it's a warning shot to the Democratic Party. Puts pressure on the Democratic Party to move it or lose it, as it were. Attempting to show power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the established or official powers, in this case the Democratic Party. Mm. Uh, challenging the Democratic Party to grant suffrage or face opposition from John. Mentioned it's written on June 3rd, going to the Congressional Union. Uh, Suzanne said, a warning shot to Woodrow Wilson. I s Hannah says, it's an appeal from Alice Paul to the Democratic Party and other Democrats. Irene says, it's a rebuke to the Democratic Party. Kristen says, you're answering an accusation about the Congressional Union. Explain what the union's about, what the Women's Party expects from Congress. Alana says, it's a ploy to get more attention and focus on the movement, that any conversation at the time would keep the movement in the public eye. Mary makes an interesting observation. It includes her position as national chairman, so she's using her title. Hmm. Continuing on, a quick and easy one. Um, who created this? It's easy with this one because there's a name attached. I would encourage you, if you're working with your students on this, to move beyond simply the name and think about, so who was Alice Paul and what was her role in this? And I think especially for researching this year's theme of leadership and legacy, getting beyond a name to thinking about the role the person plays could be rich and productive. Um, we won't linger here. Let's move on to the next rich and meaty question. Um, what's the larger story or context within which this was printed? And that allows you to observe the primary source that's in front of you, but also think about what you already know about this time period. Uh, 
Chandra said uh, women were being included at the state level, but not nationally. Uh, Laura's response, Congress is in session. Uh, their political union is also meeting. They're hoping to spur congressional action. Hannah says, context is perhaps the struggle to get a woman's suffrage amendment passed through Congress. Matthew's talking about the refusal of the Democratic Party to support suffrage, especially President Woodrow Wilson. Tiffany says, is talking about the divisiveness of the suffrage movement. John talks about World War I and the Alien and Sedition Acts, that it was critical to address the quote-unquote anti-democratic accusation. Uh, Jan also mentions that 1916 is in the midst of World War I. Uh, Alana is talking about pushing for constitutional amendment versus state-by-state state enfranchisement. Is it a federal issue or is it a state issue? Wonderful, wonderful. I, I appreciate all the background information that you bring. Um, and the last question that I'd like to ponder with you is, what do you still wonder about? What questions does this raise? And you can think about it in terms of just this primary source or the two that we've seen plus other things that you know from other sources. Uh, here's a question from Laura. Did it work for the Women's Congress? Thank you, Laura. Let's see here. Amber says, I was wondering if there was only one assembly or more than that. Uh, Tiffany, oh, sorry, these are bouncing fast. These are great ideas. Uh, Jan's talking about gaining the exposure and the rights. Did they find what they were seeking? Uh, Kristen asked, what did they do next? Uh, John said he'd love to see the primary sources that prompted the response from Alice Paul. Hannah says there's no given year. How close was this to the 19th Amendment? Amanda says uh, if, if Alice Paul became more influential in the 20th century after Elizabeth Casey and, and Susan B. Anthony, why is she lesser known? Matthew asks about the politics of the suffrage movement in context of national politics and total war and mobilization during World War I. Amber responded, this would make a great comic book. <laughs> Irene asked, did the Women's Party enter the fall elections that year? Susan asked, was Alice Paul the first national chairman? Lynn asked, how was this response received? Did anyone respond to Alice Paul in her letter? Mary asked, why, is, if the CU is called anti-democratic, what other reasons do they have? Jacob asked, why didn't Congress just let women work eventually, uh, even though there were no founding mothers? Dan is asking, where does this fit relative to women picketing the White House, asking President Wilson how long? Those are all wonderful questions, and we could probably continue for some time to come. Um, as questions occur, feel free to enter them in. I will say this, some of those questions about what preceded and came after this um, could be answered by further research in this newspaper archive, and um, that could be a productive approach for a student who's, who's working um, in a topic that the, that the newspaper archive would cover, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. What I'd like to do is, is keep moving. What, what we're doing is sort of a model research process very quickly, assuming um, a lot of skills on your part already. Obviously, if you were working with supporting students, you would pace it according to their needs. So revisiting, revisiting the questions for investigation that came out of the initial primary source analysis. Think about what role did Alice Paul play in the leadership of the suffrage movement? What was the legacy of Alice Paul and the Congressional Union for Woman Suffrage? And think about which of those questions have been answered and what new questions you have from this additional source. So spend just a minute, um, and if you want to just 
type in either answered or new and label them, that's fine. So what questions have been answered? What new questions do you have? And it would be fine if you put A and N and if you didn't want to type out the full words. Hannah's asking a question about finding hidden or obscure sources to find quality ones, and I think you'll talk a little bit about that later, right, Cheryl? A little bit, yes. Yeah, and Cheryl will show you a, a, a resource that you can use to ask questions if you can't find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's less important to me that we actually do the research process, um, but this would be how I would approach it with students, I was not a history teacher, but I was a high school English teacher for quite some time, and we did a lot of, of research. So um, again, as questions occur, feel free to put them in. I'm going to move on and talk a little bit more about our approaches as we put this together that would model some of your students' thinking as they research in their projects. Okay, um, Cheryl, I'm going to stop you right there. And a question came through, uh, one for Lynn, which was, will the text be available, the, the questions that are being submitted, will that be available in, the, in what you're posting tomorrow, Lynn? I'm going to double check on that from my end. I'm not sure that okay. I have access to a transcript, but if I do have access, I will post it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Cheryl, go ahead. Sure. Um, this, again, is excerpted from the theme book. Um, there's a whole long checklist of considerations for selecting primary sources. Um, and in the theme book, we wrote them as something that students could take on pretty carefully and, and use. We adapted those from a set of, of considerations that we use in teacher workshops, um, and a few of them to think about are the creator or author was a participant in or an eyewitness to the event or time. The item was created at the time of the event or slightly before or after. So time of the event and, and creation are crucial to thinking about primary sources. The item is significant because it comes directly from a participant or witness or, a, or is a first-hand account of an item. And finally, from the student perspective, um, I debated with my colleague a long time about whether to include the last one and de decided it's, it's worth lifting up. The item supports an idea or concept in my project. And I know because I was stalking you on Twitter um, as I was struggling with my own technology um, that Kathy talked about the value of really digging into the primary sources, not simply adding them to the bibliography um, as a citation, but really using them to support and develop an idea or concept. As some of you have done tonight in your answers, where you're taking a hypothesis and using evidence to support it. Um, so again, this is on in the theme book. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions about it, but um, if there are no questions, I'm, I'm very, I'd like to just keep moving on and talk about your own practice and how what you bring from your experiences in teaching with primary sources. Um, Cheryl, a question came in that says, which comes first, the concept idea that the sources support or looking at the sources to develop the concept idea? You know, I think that's a really terrific um, question and one of the reasons we started with the map was to model a way that a primary source can spark some concepts and ideas. Um, 
I think if, if you have some broad thoughts on where you'd like to take the project um, and can, can then therefore choose some primary sources judiciously as opposed to randomly, um, then I think that, that really the primary source can drive developing the concepts and ideas. Great, thank you. Here's Thanks a question for you, Cheryl. Uh, uh, Kristen asks, how can I compare the women's suffrage movement to other efforts to gain the right to vote? That's a fantastic question. And, and I'm going to turn it back and say, um, you know, let's, let's, let's think about that together you, in the chat box. How would you do those comparisons? And I, and I guess one thing that I'll drop in to start the conversation is the Library of Congress is rich in primary sources around women's suffrage. Um, <clears throat> what other events would you compare it to and where would you find the information would be a starting place for it? I'd, I'd love to hear ideas from others of you. Karen shares recognize the difference, the differences first and foremost. Jan also made an interesting point that often students approach a topic from one direction with certain opinions, but then their position changes based on research, especially primary source research. Oh yes, 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 I have seen that in my teaching career. Uh, you could probably compare this to the African American suffrage um, movement. Thanks, Amber. Hannah suggests maybe you want to start with a shared topic. So maybe look at something like Seneca Falls, where the women's rights movement intersects with other movements at the time. And also from Amber, you can also compare this to the African American suffrage movement as well. Terrific. I think asking the questions are, are crucially important and thinking strategically. Um, you know, you could, I can see in your answers, you can compare it to something that was happening at the time to other movements. You can compare it to something that was happening in a different time but use some of the same strategies. Um, you could look at the strategies used in the different movements. So I, I think there's not a single approach, but these are um, a lot of ideas for looking at the different facets and finding the, the fit between the student's research interest and the information available. Any other questions out there that I'm not seeing, Lynn or Kathy, or no, other I, comments you'd like to drop in? I would say it's a good segue into we're coming up on about uh, 13 minutes left of the program, so I think uh, you still have a lot of resources to share with them. I would keep moving forward. Fantastic. Um, let's go two slides forward. To the, the next one, there we go. So this is the Library of Congress homepage. I'm hoping it's at least passingly familiar. And I'd like to just hit on a couple of starting places. Um, and again, Lynn will post this tomorrow. It'll be, links will be available. So don't worry too much about scribbling notes. Just take in my information and, and think about what you'd like to know from me. Um, so there's a bubble at the bottom of the screen around teachers. And that's your starting place. That's the pre-built, ready-to-go, quickest access point. And although it's uh, meant to serve teachers, there's a lot here that students can access as well. So I'd like to show you what the teachers page looks like and focus it on just a couple of particular places. Um, just hit enter once more, if you would. So to the left, there's a bubble around classroom materials. And those include, next slide, a whole bunch of things, um, including lesson plans that you might be familiar with, presentations and activities. But the, the gold starting place is the top of the list, the primary source sets. Those are sets of primary sources on specific topics. And um, I want to show you what that looks like. Or here are the topics, rather, um, the top part of it. Um, and a primary source set example looks like this. 
This is the woman's suffrage primary source set. You can see all the thumbnails, um, and this is only, again, the top half of the page. There are oh, between 18 and 21, um, including the map that we started our analysis with. Um, it does not include the article. The article came from the theme book materials. So this is a great starting place, not to say that you wouldn't supplement your research with things from, from other parts of the library's website. One thing I'd like to point out, in addition to the primary sources, which can be used online or in a printable PDF if it's something printable, there's a teacher's guide um, up at the top um, of the page. And uh, just go back for a second, if you would. Thank you. Um, there's a teacher's guide at the top of the page and an, a link to the analysis tool and guides. And we'll take a look at the analysis tool page in just a moment. Um, let's go on and look at the next resource that I'd like to highlight. And that's the using primary sources over in the left column. And that includes Lots of things, like a rationale for using primary sources, guides to citing primary sources from the Library of Congress, but also the teacher guides and analysis tool. And that's where I want to focus this evening, um, the teacher's guides and analysis tool, just to give you some sense of the scope of it. The primary source analysis tool comes in two forms, a printable PDF version, or an online interactive version that your students can work on and if you're going to a paperless environment, it does include the option for them to download it, email it, or even print it, which is not paperless, but sometimes it's useful. And then you can see, again, this is the top part of it, a general guide to analyzing primary sources, a guide on analyzing oral histories, and then the two that I drew from tonight, analyzing books and other printed texts, and analyzing photographs and prints. Um, those two were the source for all of the questions that you engaged with this evening. Um, continuing on again, Lynn and, uh, Lynn and Kathy, interrupt me if you see a question come in. Um, the next thing I'd like to do, if you would just hit the arrow one more time, uh, a professional development resource. Continuing. Um, this is a very quick tour to finding primary sources. If you'd like a more leisurely tour, in the PD section, there's a set of online modules. And the one at the very bottom of the page walks you through steps for finding primary sources. It's a self-directed online module. If you do it beginning to end, it's about an hour. But you're welcome to pick and choose um, start and stop as your time allows. So let's look at what's behind all of these teacher-built resources. Back to the library's homepage. You can see the drop-down menu so that your search can be focused by format if you like. Sometimes students know that they learn better in a particular way or they're looking for a particular kind of item. And so this drop-down of formats can be very helpful. And then you can type your keywords into the search box. Um, I'm going to talk about generating search terms on the next slide. This is familiar. Um, if you would hit the key one more time, I want you to zero in on these subjects in the middle of the bib record page. It includes the name of Alice Paul. Now you can get the name from the item. It also includes a couple of other subjects, Congressional Union for Woman Suffrage. And what strikes me as interesting about this is we say women's suffrage, plural, but these both, National Women's Party and Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, use it as a singular. And that, that may well affect a search result. Um, and then suffrage and suffragists. So the subject lines can be a really helpful place to scour for search terms, and especially when researching historical topics. Um, as you well know, 
using the historically, the times that were contemporary to the history can often give you better results than uh, using terms that we use now. So let's take a look at a results page. This is the search results page for Alice Paul searching in photos, prints, and drawings. And you can see in the blue bar about a third of the way down the page, it says original format, photos, prints, and drawings. This works the way many websites do. You can use the X to turn that off if you decide that this is not the right format for your purposes or if you just want to continue exploring. There are also um, additional limiter choices down the left column. Um, if, if, we, if we were scrolling down the page, there'd be lots of options that, again, you can use to refine the search. Um, back to the library's homepage just to keep you oriented. I want to spend a few minutes exploring the historic newspaper database. And that's in the grid of thumbnails. It's in the top right. And um, this is a project that the library does jointly with the National Endowment for the Humanities. You can see in the top, in the middle of this blue bar, it says um, from 1836 to 1922. That's the range that this database covers right now. It's a growing um, as states join the program. So it, it'll continue expanding. Um, <clears throat> so if your students are researching a topic that falls in this time span, this is a gold mine. Most of you probably have access to expensive subscription databases. Your students may or may not be able to get to those at home, but this one's free for everybody. One of the safe um, time savers in this is the folks who work with it put together recommended topics. And I'd like to take a look for just a quick minute at those recommended topics. Um, we've pulled up the page beginning by decade. And you can get a sense of some of the, the range of it. It goes from uh, as silly as Halloween to as serious as Appomattox and blockade runners in the Civil War. Um, I've chosen a topical example to show you what the topics page give you. This is the page on the 19th Amendment. It includes a list of important dates, which are crucially important if you're searching a newspaper database. Narrowing it to dates can really um, improve your results and make, make the search more efficient. And then it includes suggested search terms and tips. And below the search terms are a list of sample articles as well. So if you find a topic that you're searching on, um, this, is, this is really a terrific thing. Um, Lynn, if you would go back a couple of slides. I'm looking for a, a screen of the library's homepage. Kathy promised that I would show a resource, and I'm going to <laughs> honor her promise. So you know me well. <laughs> back to the library's homepage. In the very upper right corner, and Kathy, make a note that we need to add this to the link slides, because um, people will want to find this. In the very upper right corner, there's a little, um, would be easy to overlook gray link that says, Ask a Librarian. That's your access point to the librarians who serve the Library of Congress. They staff this. They take your questions. Um, the way the form works is you say what you have already looked in and what you're looking for, and they'll, they'll give you an answer within five days, um, depending on the complexity of, of how much work they have to do to find it. It can be terrifically, terrifically useful. They're also really good at sniffing out um, students trying to get somebody else to do their homework. So. <laughs> Just be forewarned, this is not necessarily where you start your research, but it's a terrific resource for later. Um, I believe we are ready to entertain last questions and a request for feedback. So I, Cheryl, a couple questions came in while you were talking. One was, um, are these resources available for uh, homeschool uh, parents? 
um, and teachers? And the answer is yes. I had sent a, a note to the person who asked that question. Um, all of the library's resources that were shared tonight are without registration. Um, and so anyone is welcome to use them. Uh, and as far as the materials that are served up on the teachers page, um, there are no known restrictions in terms of copyright. So we have taken that question out of it for you. In terms of the loc.gov at large, uh, that is the rights and uh, become your responsibility. And so you can look at the bibliographic records. Another question came in about the links. Um, will they be emailed to the accounts that we use to register? Um, I went ahead and answered that as yes. We will have all of the links um, in the uh, presentation. Um, and that will actually get sent out to the email that you used to register. Um, we do have a, a comment that came in from Susan about my students have used the Ask a Librarian and have been so impressed with the attention and focus they receive. And Susan, we will definitely pass that along. Um, uh, our, uh, uh, the, the folks who serve uh, the institution um, uh, love to hear those kinds of comments, and uh, we're happy to pass that along. Um, there is a question about topics. This is actually not the time um, for, for uh, topic exploration. Um, so we're going to table that uh, for another time and another presentation. Well, I appreciate it. I know it's just after 8 o'clock on the East Coast here, and we know that people do need to get going. What I'd like to do is ask everyone, before you log out, if you could just take two seconds for us, uh, please go to tinyurl.com slash nhdwebinars. It will be a very quick question. Uh, there will also be an option for a digital badge. So if you're a student looking for extra credit and you want an email from me tomorrow that proves that you stayed to the end and you fill that out, we'll take care of that. Also, if you're a teacher, please fill one of these out. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and send that, you know, give that to your principal or your supervisor. I know that a lot of you do a lot of work outside of the required hours for school, and I think it's important that they see that you're seeking professional development and doing that on your own time. At this point, I just want to say thank you very, very much. We apologize for the technical challenges, but there always have to be a couple, right? But thank you so much to Cheryl Letterly and Kathy McGuigan from the Library of Congress for their help in getting this going. To let you know if you're interested in more, we'll be coming back September 25th with a specific focus on photos and prints, and coming back in October and November looking at newspapers and maps. So these are great ways to dive into one type of source, and Cheryl and Kathy do a great job of showing you some examples, diving in, and helping you get your students, like we said in the beginning, from just identifying a document, but being able to analyze it and use it as part of their argument. So thank you, ladies, for all of your help tonight. We'll leave this up for just a moment. If you have a question, go ahead and put that in, and we'll close out in just a few minutes. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Wen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your participation tonight. It doesn't work until you participate. So we thank you for, for hanging in there and, uh, and having such lively conversation uh, with us tonight. And I just want to second Kathy's comments. That's exactly right. It's a pleasure working with you. Look for an email. It'll come in just about 24 hours. It'll give you the link to the webinar and all of the resources here. Feel free to share that with your friends and colleagues. We know that not everybody can make it. We also know that it's back to school night season. So if you have a friend who couldn't be on tonight or a colleague, uh, please share this with them because we're happy to put this out there to get as much access to as many of our teachers as possible. Last call for any questions from any of our participants. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is Lynn O'Hara from National History Day. I'm going to go ahead and wrap the webinar and have a great evening.